And I happen to think this is a more accurate interpretation of what's been happening in Moscow over the last couple of weeks. You see a Russian president realizing that through his own hubris, he has bitten off far, far more than he can chew, that the plans have not been developing in the way that he thought they would, that the consequence of international, international sanctions has brought the Russian economy almost to its knees, and that out of necessity, Russia must now seek to be the junior partner in a relationship with China. Hello and welcome to Frontline with Lucy Fisher for Times Radio. I'm delighted to be joined today by James Heapy, the UK Defence Minister for the Armed Forces. James, you yourself are a former military man, uh, an officer. You reached the rank of major while serving with the Rifles Regiment for a decade. And I know you undertook operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Northern Ireland, uh, and I think Kenya. So um, you're obviously very well placed in your current role. James has been uh, a defense minister since 2019. He was previously uh, minister for procurement, and he has been a conservative MP for Wells and Somerset since 2015. Welcome and thanks for speaking to Times Radio today. Thanks, Lucy. So we've got a lot to get through uh, as we meet here in the bowels of uh, the Ministry of Defence, known in military circles as Main Building. Uh, we're going to talk about Ukraine, the government's integrated review refresh, uh, and also growing tensions in the Indo-Pacific. But if we can start with Ukraine, uh, James, and I think one of the latest uh, developments this week is Vladimir Putin responding quite angrily to the UK government's decision to send shells tipped with depleted uranium to Ukraine. He said that this is a move that is equivalent to deploying dirty bombs in the war and that Russia could respond to the UK. How concerned are you by his response? I mean, we, we shouldn't be surprised that that sort of disinformation is being deployed by the Kremlin. They know as well as we know that um, the use of depleted uranium in anti-armor shells has been common for decades. It is most definitely not uh, of any sort of weapons grade or weapons capability. It is not the proliferation of nuclear technology or nuclear material. And they know that. Everybody in NATO knows that. This is just confected Russian anger at something that is commonplace on the modern battle space. But it is unfortunately reflective of Kremlin behavior over the last year, and we can't be complacent over the way that their information is received in the world beyond NATO. Uh, and so obviously the UK needs to be careful, like having this opportunity of speaking to you, to be quick to call out that sort of very alarmist <coughs> disinformation. I think that is right to reassure members of the public who might hear the words depleted uranium mm. and feel quite uh, alarmed by that. Uh, what about the Russian threat to respond to the UK? What, what form could that take? I mean, look, we, we, we've seen throughout the last 15, 16 months that they have constantly sought to confect false flag moments to justify something they were already intending to do or to up the ante in the hope of uh, causing the consensus that supports Ukraine to fracture. Um, I don't know what they will uh, what they will threaten as a response, but I can guarantee that it is a completely unnecessary response to a confected alarmist position that they've taken, and that you know I think everybody who is part of the Ukraine donor community understands that very well indeed. There's absolutely no concern from our allies and partners. Depleted uranium and anti-armor tank rounds is, is commonplace. Um, but like I say, really the audience we need to be careful about is the audience in the world beyond, and that's why we need to be taking opportunities like these and others over the, the weeks ahead, just to be very clear that this is not what the Kremlin are presenting. And I want to get into talking to you about the state of play on the ground in Ukraine. Um, but just around some of this wider geopolitics, it's felt like a big week for that as Xi Jinping has landed in Moscow. Yeah. Um, is this morphing into a wider conflict between the West and a strengthened uh, axis, a strengthened alliance of autocracies, Russia and China in particular? Well, I mean, I think there's two ways of interpreting what we saw in Moscow over the last couple of days. It's so important to note that Xi, I think, is in Kyiv as well. Um, 
the uh, you know you could say that this is the cementing of a Sino-Russian alliance that um, that makes this a competition between two rival spheres far bigger than 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 Ukraine, or and I happen to think this is a more accurate interpretation of what's been happening in Moscow over the last couple of weeks, you see a Russian president realizing that through his own hubris, he has bitten off far, far more than he can chew, that the plans have not been developing in the way that he thought they would, that the consequence of international, international sanctions has brought the Russian economy almost to its knees, and that out of necessity, Russia must now seek to be the junior partner in a relationship with China that is possibly irreversibly to its strategic disadvantage. Uh, and I, um, I think when you, when you reach the point where, you know, for Russia, it is dependent on China, and we'll, we'll, we can come to arms in a minute, but just, just strategically in terms of resources, technology, um, economic inward investment, then that is, and if you had rewinded 18 months and said to Putin that to your west you will see a NATO with double the length of border that it had previously with Finland and mm. Sweden uh, acceding to, to NATO, and to your east you would become entirely dependent on China, the junior partner in a relationship, um, he would have regarded that as strategic failure and found it very unattractive, and yet that's where I think we've reached. I think that appraisal is really interesting and, and spells uh, a, a sort of a very poor outcome for Russia, but potentially a good outcome for China and, and a very difficult um, growing growth of China's power base if it has successfully not enslaved, but perhaps uh, encouraged Russia's dependence on it for markets, for uh, the sale of, of uh, commodities, energy in future. That makes it more difficult for the West in, in the sort of tensions with China, doesn't it? Und undeniably. And I, I think that's why you've heard such a strong response from the White House over China's uh, apparent engagement with Russia, possibly with a view to supporting its war aims in Ukraine. Um, and there is no doubt that the Chinese industrial base is allowing them to arm at real pace. And the scale of the, um, of the growth of the PLA, the PLA Navy, PLA Air Force, is, is concerning. But the, 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 the sort of consolation in all of that is the lack of war fighting now, some proven battlefield technology within the PLA and its Air Force and its Navy. And so uh, a relationship between Russia and China that sees proven warfighting technology proliferating to the Chinese from the Russians, with the Russians you know, forced out of necessity to share that stuff because they're the junior partner in that relationship, um, is a concern. That's why you see the strong response from, from the White House. Um, I think that I, I don't think it fundamentally changes anything. You know, I thought that you know, Commander Indo Paycom, um, Admiral Aquilino, gave a great speech in Singapore last week um, for the IISS think tank. And he, you know, he, he, he set out a very well-established U.S. position over Taiwan, but an insistence that the U.S. as a legitimate Pacific actor had a duty to... To, to demonstrate a f right to freedom of navigation and to stand in solidarity with other partners in the region. And so, look, you know, I think the sort of what is going on as they set the Indo-Pacific theater won't be affected by what's happened in Moscow over the last 24 hours or so, but it just brings a, a new dimension to what is already quite a challenging geostrategic situation. Mm. I, I do want to talk to you more about China, <clears throat> but just to, just to sort of rock through a few more questions on, on Ukraine. Um, interesting that one of the outcomes of the meeting between Xi and uh, Putin this week has been this um, reaffirmation of the idea that a nuclear war would generate no winners 
uh, and therefore must more, not be unleashed exactly. in, in the language they use. Can we trust Putin on that, or, or is it being too credulous to sort of take him at face value? Um, no, I, do, I don't think we can trust Putin on anything. But it's also important to note that throughout all of this, the only person who's ever reached for the nuclear sabre to rattle is Putin. Mm -hmm. It's just been a, a sort of rhetorical opportunity that he's taken to sort of you know, up the ante when his back is against the wall in a sort of conventional military sense. But to my point about the strategic failure of Putin, both in the West with Finland joining NATO, but crucially in the East with their increasing clienthood to, to China and their sort of their subjugation to, to Xi. Xi knows that it is not remotely in the Chinese strategic interest to see the nuclear proliferation taboo broken. You know, the first use of any sort of nuclear weapon, even tactical, would break a taboo around proliferation that would have consequences in Iran and the Middle East, obviously, but also for China, would have consequences possibly with Japan, South Korea, mm -hmm. and others. So it is so obviously in Xi's strategic interests to keep a lid on that taboo that perversely you find the Western Xi in complete alignment over the need for that nuclear taboo to remain completely intact. Um, and, you know, I think that, therefore, the fact that that was an outcome of their meeting in the Kremlin is something that we should take, A, as a reflection of Putin now does what Xi says, mm -hmm. but B, as a reassurance that Xi sees it as we do, that that nuclear lid must be kept firmly on the box. Let's just look for a moment at cooperation in the West. Uh, another development uh, in recent days has been the EU signing off this €2 billion Euro package yeah. to supply Ukraine with a million artillery shells. That's obviously good news uh, for Ukraine. Where do you sort of stand on the EU moving into this uh, procurement space? Is, it, is it a good thing? Delighted. So okay. I, 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 and can the UK, should the UK try and get in on this and, and, and would we be welcomed do you think maybe i mean i suspect i suspect we would be welcome to it before you get into the sort of gritty bit of who actually manufactures it and where the value goes mm -hmm. but at the macro level i'm certain we'd be valued in fact yesterday and uh monday evening i was in brussels for the inaugural schumann um, defense and security forum which is the eu's um ambition to have a wider security dialogue beyond the 27 with its kind of near neighbors of whom we are the nearest um and I was incredibly well met. Um, we speak a few hours before the Windsor framework gets voted on in Parliament, uh, and I suspect that people were just trying to make mischief out of mm. it. But I did find it quite extraordinary that you know, yesterday, uh, as I arrived in at the meeting in, in the European Parliament, um, I stood in front of a camera and I said, great to be back, Windsor framework success, and as we now put the last six or seven years behind us, where our interests align, we should be looking to whether we'll, more, we'll work together ever more closely to, on issues of mutual advantage. Now, if I said that in Canberra or Washington or Tokyo, everybody would be like, quite right, absolutely. But there's still a toxicity about a relationship with the EU of any sort that immediately piques the interests of journalists back here. And that is There's a toxicity that comes mainly from your party. Oh, and a mischief making more generally in the light, you know, with the with the vote coming. I mean, I just think that the EU, we are now an independent sovereign country. We're not in the EU. Everybody's clear on that. But the EU is a multinational organisation whose members almost always vote the way that we do in the UN. The EU almost always takes a position on big geostrategic issues of the day in the G7 that is aligned with the US, France, Italy, Germany. Um, the EU, providing it does not seek to compete with NATO as the hard power cornerstone of Euro-Atlantic security, is clearly the forum through which most NATO members coordinate their wider governmental responses to crisis. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the EU isn't a security actor with whom the UK should, of course, seek to work where it is in our mutual interests and to our mutual advantage seems to me to be, to be nuts. Now, I, I actually think that to most people that's, that's self-evident. 
the opportunity therefore to do stuff together industrially, why not? I mean, as, as an example, we are cooperating with the French on a whole load of capabilities. We're cooperating with the Italians on the Global Combat Air Program. We're working with the Germans on stuff. So bilaterally, we're mm -hmm. working, those working with the Swedes. Um, and the can Norwegians. I press you for any sort of example of where we could um, work on a joint uh, program with the EU on procurement or manufacturing of ammunition or other arms? Well, I mean, jointly with the EU, I, I don't know that I've got an immediate example, I'm just accepting the premise that it could be something sure. that's perfectly possible to do and that we already do stuff bilaterally with lots of European countries. Um, NATO is similarly interested in the idea of common stockpiles shared by all and an industrial effort to achieve them. So there's a sort of complementary thing between, but NATO doesn't have in its gift the wider levers of industrial strategy mm -hmm. to deliver that. It can, it can set an ambition to have a common stockpile, but you can see how the EU becomes quite an important partner in terms of the industrial strategy required to, to deliver some of that. Um, so I, you know, I, I just think that this is a time of such geoeconomic and geostrategic complexity that notwithstanding the lingering domestic challenge of talking about working with the EU, um, those of us who think about defence, security and foreign policy have to kind of realise that, that working with the EU is part of our future security architecture, but not in any sort of preferred way, not out of obligation, not automatically, but just as we choose to work with America, we choose to work with Australia, we choose to work with Japan or Canada, we will choose to work with the EU when mm -hmm. it's in our mutual interest to do so. Um, speaking of Japan in particular, um, Fumio Kishida, the Japanese Premier, has been in Kyiv uh, this week. I wonder, you rightly point out that the UK has bilateral uh, defence cooperation with Japan. Does there need to be a widening of NATO or a sort of new alliance that brings in other democracies from the global community beyond the wider uh, European, Euro-Atlantic sphere? So I think a widening of NATO is challenging, challenging at both ends of the spectrum. Firstly, because I think there'd be an awful lot of countries, particularly in ASEAN, who would be quite alarmed mm -hmm. by that. And also at the other end of the spectrum, there are plenty of NATO countries who contribute very, very well to Euro-Atlantic security and they meet their spending obligations and they are completely committed to their obligations within to Article 5 in the Euro-Atlantic around a shared geography. Mm -hmm. But don't pretend to have global reach. Yes. And so I think that those, those European non-Pacific NATO partners with global reach, UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, there are others. We have an obligation, I think, to respond to the US's continued commitment to Euro-Atlantic security by being present in the Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. to show our solidarity and willingness alongside the US, Japan, Australia, and other partners in the region. Um, I don't think that a, a broadening a na of NATO is helpful, and I definitely don't think that an extension of Article 5 to the no. Indo-Pacific is, is something that many NATO partners in, the Europe, in Europe would find So, so that's not re realistic in the medium, perhaps long term. Um, what about any other kind of um, institutional structure? There was talk a while ago of a new kind of democracies club. Yeah. Um, do you, I, just, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is the theme that there's been huge support uh, for Ukraine from democracies in the world. Perhaps the West hasn't done that well at making the argument across the global South where uh -huh. Russia has done you know, a, a good job of selling its own narrative, s sowing disinformation. Do, do, do democracies around the world need to do more to ally with each other and make the case for their values and interests? Yes, but, so there's, there's two things to pick up on there. So uh, maybe I'll take the last one first. And I was speaking to William Haig over the weekend who had an excellent column in the Times yes. yesterday that I was cheering him on all the way with. Uh, we are losing the competition of narratives. You know, the headline numbers in the UN look pretty constant. 145, 148 mm -hmm. countries routinely will vote uh, you know, in favor of the motions we put forward that condemn Russia's behavior. The level of abstention stays broadly constant and so far, Wagner's 
expeditionary stuff has only brought Mali across into the negative column. So, so at the headline level, you'd say, all's good. But I think you know, Reuters had a thing the other day where they showed that the sentiment in, uh, in sort of you know, 70, 80% of countries was actually trending away. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I don't, think, I don't think that's because Russia has won an argument that somehow NATO is the aggressor, the Ukrainians are Nazis, or all the stuff that the tropes they throw out there. I think this is just naked self-interest, that the Europeans are focusing on a European war with the consequence being challenge to food security, fuel security, cost of living across the developing world, and the developing world is no longer the, you know, sees itself rightly as the client of its former colonial masters or of any sort of ideological sphere like in the Cold War, they just articulate their national position, which is this is making our lives really hard. We're trying to grow our economies and, uh, and sort of look after our people and your disputes are having an impact on that. Now that is a, that is, the, the, ch the problem is that that very sort of, you know, agnostic, they're not making a judgment over who's right, who's wrong in the, in the case of Ukraine, but that is fundamentally to Russia's advantage because a clamor to just freeze the conflict, not, not say who's responsible, who's won, who's lost, just freeze the conflict, is kind of to Putin's advantage mm -hmm. given where the territorial situation is in Ukraine now. I think we've also got to be very careful not to assume, you know, we, we, the language from IR to IR is really interesting. First IR, very much kind of network of liberty, network of democracies, overt aggressive selling of a rules-based international order based on liberal democracy. Um, this IR m subtly moves the dial towards seeing the world as it is, accepting that the values that we hold dear are not self-evident to every other country on the globe. Now that, that stops short of abandoning our principles. We fundamentally believe that an international system with its foundations in the current UN Charter is the best way to run the world in the interests of all, best way to govern the global commons, best way to stop us invading our neighbours and just, you know, just a good civil way of running an international community. But we can't, but sticking up for that doesn't mean that we also have to lecture and hector every partner around the world to be exactly like us. Because when we do that, we risk letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. We pull up the drawbridge. And when Lavrov arrives on the next plane in after mm -hmm. our foreign secretary or defense secretary or trade secretary or prominent have left, what they say is, were well, the Brits here lecturing you again about how perfect they are? Well, switch on the TV and check out what their democracy looks like over the last year. And actually, we're here not to lecture you, but just to do some business that's in our mutual interest yes. and help you achieve your aims. So the, the, this IR, I think, is far more realistic about the global political situation. Stands true to our belief that a rules-based international system in the image of Western liberal democracy is the best way to do things. Because fundamentally, autocracy strictly, you know, narrowly, that, that narrowly prioritizes national interest isn't really a rules-based international system. That's just competing national interests. Yeah. Um, but, but we can't take that as self-evident. We've got to work hard to get out there. And, and my God, have we got a fantastic foreign secretary at the moment who is being really well met. The pictures of him in Astana over the weekend, you know, right in Putin's backyard, being really well met and not lecturing, just making the case in the spirit of friendship and partnership, like brilliant. Rishi, I think, is doing brilliantly in the big international fora where he is regarded as very competent, very geostrategically and geoeconomically aware, and his opinion is listened to and valued. And then we've got a defense secretary who's been in post for, what, nearly four years, yes. is really well known internationally, is respected as having good strategic <coughs> judgment. So the UK actually is now in a really good place, you know, with a great, Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, Defence Secretary, Trade Secretary to go out and make those, make that case mm -hmm. in a way that understands and embraces and the concerns of the Global South whilst at the same time making the point about the world that binds us. That was an essay which is probably too long and you, there was another part of your question on the Far East, if not NATO, I think there's a trend to minilateralism that we should embrace 
so AUKUS, the Quad, mm -hmm. um, ASEAN Defence Plus, um, you know, th there may be more that emerges. Those sorts of, that sort of tapestry of minilateral um, relationships feels like the sort of, you know, that's very much the zeitgeist. You know, I, 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 at the conference I was at last week, people were talking about, you know, this is, a, this is an age of polycrisis to which the response is a kind of polycentric politics that, that recognises it's, it's not bipolar, it's not even sort of multipolar, it's just, you know, there's just constant, you know, little solutions emerging to little problems all over the place, whether they be, you know, the Accra Initiative in West Africa or the East Africa Standby Force in the Horn, or whether that be AUKUS and the Quad and ASEAN Plus in the Far East, you know, that's, that's the kind of age that we're in. And the challenge for those of us who think about defence and security and foreign policy is to try to weave all of that together in a way that reinforces the charter of the UN and the centrality of the United Nations rather than undermines it. Yeah. That's what, what well, we're say soaring with the eagle. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, it's, it's, it's fascinating um, to get your very considered take, take on these matters. In, in particular, I'm struck when you talk about the um, uh, integrated review refresh. On the one hand, you talk about its sort of pragmatism and this sort of avoidance of lecturing that we might have done more of uh, as a nation in the past. But I think you also um, said it, it, it sees the world as it is. Yeah. And I just wanted to press you. Is that really the case when it comes to China? Doesn't it slightly hold back from presenting China as it really is by couching the language in, in terms of Beijing being a systemic challenge rather than uh, a threat? No, I think that fundamentally sees the world as it is. So the last time we had the emergence of a bipolar competition between spheres orientated around ideology was on the back of a moment of great global schism in 1945 and in a world that hadn't globalised. The idea that the level of strategic decoupling required to get back to a full confrontation between spheres, between East and West, is possible or feasible is, is, is just not so. Now, that leads to creative tension in Canberra, in Washington, in Tokyo, and very obviously here in London, between the economic departments who see that reality over decoupling as self-evident and hugely disadvantaged to the economy versus those of us in security, defence, policy who see it as a real threat. And so the answer has to be lots of very good conversation around what it is, where, where do we need to decouple in order to be resilient and sovereign? Semiconductors is a mm -hmm. very live conversation at the moment versus actually where does the kind of offshoring manufacturing base being in China not really move the dial because it's sort of discretionary stuff. And that's the level of decoupling that we need to, to aim for. And that's the sort of compromise that I think that that, that pragmatism, that pragmatic language reflects that, you know, it, it is impossible to see full strategic decoupling. And thus anybody who thinks we're going to get to a sort of Cold War situation of completely independent spheres working within themselves and never the twain shall meet mm -hmm. that's just not realistic from where we're starting at so we need to sort of be alive to the Chinese challenge hold them to account where they are getting it wrong hold them to account for their responsibilities as a global superpower as a part of a rules-based international system and as a p5 member of the Security Council um, accept that there is a Chinese role in the global economy, accept that there will be Chinese investment in the UK, but make sure we insulate ourselves from that, that in a way that learns the lessons of the pandemic and the war, where actually your supply chain resilience is fundamentally what makes you sovereign. And in those, set, and in those key areas, we need to decouple and invest in the things that we need to look after ourselves. Well, I know the I IRR, uh, as it's now known, uh, makes a start on that. And I know yeah. there's going to be new approaches, I think, coming on semiconductors, exactly. critical minerals. Yes, uh, and long other. overdue on critical minerals. Yes. A really important piece of work. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll watch out for those strategies being um, published. You know, I, will, uh, I have to get uh, to the question of funding. Um, the IRR came with an extra five billion, less than half of what Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, was seeking. As a former army man in particular, I wanted to ask you, we know that most of this money is going to be sent on submarines, a little bit's going to be spent on replenishing ammunition that's been given to Kyiv, not a lot left over for land warfare, and it, particularly at a time when the army is being salami sliced to the smallest size since the Napoleonic era. So, look, I mean, first of all, 
the fact that we got five billion quid is a great outcome, shows that the Prime Minister and Chancellor are good to their word in the um, autumn budget. And you know, they both recognise that we're in an increasingly uh, unstable and insecure world and in which defence spending needs to be, be made. Um, nobody ever in government negotiations gets exactly what they ask for and so um, I think Ben and I and everybody else in this building who work so hard to make the case were, were delighted with the settlement that we got. People say well yeah but it's very narrowly structured to be specifically for submarines and ammunition. Well, let's take those in turn. If the money on the nuclear program which is non-discretionary is the bedrock of our sovereignty, uh, it is our deterrence against the worst kind of aggression. If that money wasn't there, it would be coming from the core defence budget and that would lead to balanced investment decisions that would be monstrously difficult to make and to the disadvantage of our wider conventional armed forces, the army included. So that money to buy out the inflationary risk in the nuclear programme is very, very important because it allows us to keep focusing on the programme as it was mm -hmm. for the rest of defence. But we know that the Treasury's long had this contingency fund that's separate for the nuclear deterrent. But I think people uh, were expecting the money not, to come not, from yeah, but not, the MOD budget. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that, that is, it, it, the, it is, you know, we wish it weren't the case, mm. but yeah, if the, you know, the nuclear program was going to be for us to, to resolve. So that money is, is significant. It, it saves us from having to make very difficult decisions elsewhere in defence. And then on the stockpiles thing, I mean, that is, that's two million in addition to another 500 million that we got um, uh, six, seven months ago, and of course, in addition to the sort of 20 billion or 18 billion that Ben secured from Boris and when Rishi was Chancellor two years sure. ago. So, defence has been on a wonderful upwards trajectory. And that. But that still focus, facing real term but cuts. That focus on lethality, well, I'll come to that, Lucy, but that, that focus on lethality and stockpiles is important. A, your stockpiles are part of your deterrence, the credibility with which you can fight sustainably is part of what stops you from taking you on in the first place. Secondly, um, it allows us to get an industrial base going again so we can have a consistent supply of munitions and that again is part of our deterrence because it shows a scalability to our war effort that stops people from taking us on. And then thirdly, what we've seen in Ukraine is that relatively old platforms, T-72, MiG-29, BMP-2, retrofitted with modern munitions, modern sensors, actually has a real place in the battlefield. You know, the idea, the base platform itself and its survivability is not the place to be spending money at the moment because the missile technology is in the ascendancy. It doesn't matter how heavily you up armour stuff. If it's found, it's dead. Mm -hmm. So actually, cheap platforms onto which you put ever more lethal munitions and ever more sophisticated sensors is the kind of lesson of Ukraine. So the fact that the money is around stockpiles, that's music to our ears because lethality and size of stockpile is a real focus for Ben and I and this department at the moment. Um, as for whether there need to be uh, cuts or imbalanced investment decisions elsewhere, look, there, are, there are lessons from Ukraine that we have to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, you know, I think that with a Secretary of State who's been in post for four years, I've been here for three and a half years, um, we've got a CDS that is two years in, a PermSec that is two years in, there is the confidence at the top of the MOD now to see the lessons that are le being learnt in Ukraine and to be willing to take the difficult decisions that allow us to apply those lessons soonest. Because I, for one, find it nuts that I can procure stuff at speed for the Ukrainian armed forces that make the Ukrainian armed forces, in some cases, more sophisticated in their sensors and more lethal in their munitions than the UK is and the programme we've got to get after that challenge is still three to five years away from delivery. I think we have to be willing to, to disrupt a bit and look at, you know, how do we see the threat in the world as it is now, see the advantage that our work with the Ukrainians and the Americans to spiral Ukrainian capability has brought, engage intelligence, science, industry innovation, and military cunning, which I think is the kind of the four parts of the, of the, of the spiral in contact. So embrace that, get our scientists sciencing, our innovators innovating, our intelligence people thinking long and hard about 
what they're doing and get our military being ever more cunning and devious and you know thinking thinking the unthinkable about what the modern battlefield looks like and then we as leaders need to have the confidence in the longevity of our time in office to say look we, we if no one can make the case for that then who on earth can because that's really hard for someone in their first six months as secretary of state or a minister to make and it's politically quite challenging but but you know we've been in office during this time we've seen in our own eyes the the, the speed with which we can make a difference for ukraine so why on earth wouldn't we want to do that for our own armed forces yeah well that makes complete sense the way you've said it uh, James Heapy, uh, I wanted to get into uh, what's going on on the ground in Ukraine. We'll have to leave We're that winning. till next time. We're winning. Okay. The, the Ukrainians yeah. are going to win. We've just got to stick with them. And, you know, whatever happens with global banking, American politics, European cost of living, stick with them. Because they will, as James said, you know, th James Cleverly, they will fight with sticks and stones if they've got nothing else to fight with. They won't stop. So, therefore, let's give them the tools to get it done on their terms. Have to. A rallying cry to end with. Slava Ukraini. That's all we've got time for now. My thanks to James Heapy, the UK Defence Minister for the Armed Forces. Thanks also to Louis Sykes, our producer. You've been watching Frontline with Lucy Fisher for Times Radio.